Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the first of a series of damage prevention webinars we're looking to run. This is a bit of a different one we'll have in store for you all today, but um, we'll just give a couple more seconds for people to uh, join in. Special welcome to all of our presenters today. We've got a few uh, very special guests uh, joining us, so welcome to you guys. We'll introduce them shortly. All right, well, I think we might get started. Um, as I said, good morning and welcome everyone to today's webinar from Pelican Corp. Uh, the first in a, a number of series of damage prevention special webinars that we'll be running. Um, and this one is uh, really uh, quite an interesting one from the perspective of, uh, certainly from, from our perspective um, and how it relinks uh, changes in data sets provided by and collected by um, our government uh, bodies and how that relates to damage prevention. But before we do that, I'll do a, uh, a quick acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may have be, um, may be here today. My name is uh, Nick Holly. I'm the sales director for uh, Pelican Corp in Asia Pacific. Uh, and joining me uh, is Jacinda Burns, who's our product manager uh, for a number of key products related to this discussion. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. All right. So there's a few things we're going to cover off today. We've got a, quite a lot of content. Um, today. So we'll give you a very brief introduction to, to Pelican Corp and who we are, um, but then we'll just get straight into uh, the, the, the main topics of discussion. So we're going to be really talking about a uh, the DCM project, the Digital Cadaster Modernization Project that's being uh, implemented and, and delivered by our friends at DELP, uh, and really about what that means to the damage prevention community. So utilities who are using that information uh, and aligning that with their digital assets uh, and what potential risks that might have if you are not changing or are not aware of the changes being uh, implemented and rolled out by, by DELP. Uh, we've also got, uh, so we'll have the people and our friends from DELP presenting that. Uh, and we've also got Charles Moscato from Yarra Valley Water for giving us a utility perspective uh, on how things, uh, how they are adapting to this change uh, and any of the things that they're looking to do. We'll open up the forum to Q&A at the end. Uh, so anyone with any questions, please uh, use the Q&A um, app within Teams to uh, to register those questions, but we'll get to those at the end. So just very quickly about Pelican Corp, we're a global organisation focused primarily on damage prevention, uh, utility damage prevention. We've got many points of presence around the globe servicing uh, a very large number of utility customers uh, and receiving uh, millions of requests for utility information, uh, which is then ultimately used for excavation uh, and construction projects globally. We have a broad suite of applications and services that we provide very much targeted around and, and suited to that purpose. Um, if anyone's got any questions or is interested in those, by all means, let us know. But I think for the purposes of today's discussion, we'll just get straight into the content. So one of the things that we're very passionate about in Pelican Corp is uh, the information that is shared by utilities into supporting uh, construction projects and services like Before You Dig. And the accuracy of that information is absolutely critical. You know, the end use case for that data is basically someone will take the plans out into the field and, and start a construction project. There are certain uh, obvious op obligations that those excavators will have in ensuring that the assets are protected and are safe and that the, the workers that they have are safe. Um, but the reliability and the and the, uh, the the trustability of that data is paramount to this whole problem. So when 
I guess the the announcement came around uh, the, this DCM project, um, and I guess it all sparked from a conversation Charles and I had some months ago, um, letting us know that there's a you know an alignment issue potentially within his organisation to the maps that uh, to the data the network records that he has, and that there'd be a body of work that they'd need to do. It sparked a, an in, a, a, I guess further investigation from, from our side. So we really wanted to bring to attention the fact that. This is a project that's going to have a potential impact if you're a utility um, and perhaps provide some guidance to you. With us today uh, are some very special guests from uh, DELP. So this is the department that is, is responsible for uh, driving the digital cadastre modernisation project. Uh, we have Mark Grant, the project director. We have David Blaine, who's the DCM uh, VicMap Integration Manager, and we also have Susie Collins, who's the Senior Integration uh, Industry Engagement Officer. Welcome. Um, so we'll hand across to I think Mark. You're you're delivering the presentation today. Is that right? Just get you off mute. I think. Yeah. There we go. Mark, just give us one moment. You're on mute. Morning, everybody. That's better. Much better. <laughs> Much better. Now, um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the country and pay my respects. Uh, are we sharing our presentation or are you, Jacinta? We will do it. OK, great. So ready when you are. Fantastic, and, and thanks again for organising the session. It's, it's just great to be out sharing the information on how far we've got with the project and um, talking about impacts and benefits that we think will derive from it. So for those who are not familiar, and apologies for those who've seen this quite a few times, uh, our, our base proposition um, with the $47 million that the government's investing um, and across four stages of work, is that we're about improving the representation of the property parcel layer and associated layers in VicMap. And the word representation is important because if you look at VicMap today, it contains that disclaimer, as it always has, that it's a representation of the position of the property parcel, not a legal declaration of where it is. Um, but of course, it becomes important, as we've heard from so many people, if um, assets and other um, important pieces of information are relating to that data set. And we are moving it, but the good news today is we've got new products, improved data, and it's not moving to a massive extent in most areas, but it is vastly improved off the base case. And I just wanted to begin this morning, something I haven't said previously, but I will make the point here today that I was looking back at the original business case for our project uh, yesterday, and. The, proper, the base position of VicMap is that it doesn't attain today in terms of the property parcel layer, the aspirational accuracy target that we set for the project of 0.5 in rural and 0.1 in metro. And it does not in 95% of Victoria. So the different targets, 0.5 in rural and 0.1 in metro. But just bear in mind as we move through today that the VicMap product today does not attain that accuracy level in 95% of both cases. So what we're about is improving that accuracy, moving the property parcel layer, putting it into VicMap <clears throat> and simultaneously building a system to automate land parcel additions to the cadastre as the development process is undertaken. Thanks, we'll have the next slide if we can. And another important point, uh, the digital cadastre itself is a giant database of the numbers that I'm going to describe in a moment. Um, it's only a part of the cadastral system. And of course, we'll always rely on licensed surveyors, IT professionals, lawyers, um, and spatial experts 
um, to build and maintain the system of cadastral uh, use as it as it applies to the land registration planning evaluation and positioning systems so uh, a big project across four stages but really only a part of something that's much larger uh, next slide thanks and here are those four stages uh, first stage is being conducted with our project partners dsm soft in Trichiopati in india they have 300 people doing nothing but typing the data from our survey and plan information that we send to them in portable document format. They capture that those uh, numbers as assigned from the surveys and plans, and they uh, associate them to points in the, in the existing map base, and they also conduct a minimally constrained adjustment, and that product passes to us uh, through an AWS environment that has automated quality checking and validation rules that are supplemented by humans in our team. We've got a, a team of um, 20 working on the project here in, in the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. So that's 300 people passing around 30,000 parcels a week to us. And I just want to acknowledge and pay tribute to all of our contractors, but I'll mention it for each of them as we move through. Um, a massive effort by DSM to be on time and transform a workforce of that size into a home working environment right through the um, the two intents and the third year of the pandemic. I'm very happy with the relationship and quality of the data that's coming out of India. Secondly, here in Australia, Spatial Vision, um, well known to everybody, I would guess, uh, are our adjustment experts and they're using the Dynajust tool to conduct a least squares adjustment to calculate the most likely position of the corner node for every single property parcel in the state where they have survey data of sufficient quality and there are actually some areas where there is no survey or the survey data can't be read or used for a particular reason and in those cases the business case for the project always assumed that high quality Digital imagery would be used to supplement the supply and use of survey data. And to date, another benefit that we're building in the project as we're going along, we've placed, once again, DSM Soft have had this added to their contract, uh, but we've placed just over 60,000 high quality nodes to supplement and support the use of the survey data. And that will actually constitute a great improvement to the survey mark control system and also to general spatial products that people will use. And I should have said in relation to the digitization process itself, we've been providing the raw data as captured and have developed a viewer um, for people to use that data. And it's proving to be quite useful for the surveying community because they can look at what may be superseded or historical data or lost, lost marks and connections to control that is appearing like magic from those captured surveys and plans. And we think that'll end up being another product called VicMap Survey, um, a new product that didn't previously exist. <coughs> Stage three of the project is with our partner Jacobs, and they are starting in earnest this week. Uh, people who have been looking would know that we've been putting the iterations of data into an object called the Integration Viewer for people to have an early look at what's coming. And I think today we've got around 27 municipalities in that viewer. Um, and you'll see if you look at it, and Dave will say more about this in a moment, supply one, supply two, and then publication supply. Um, so increasingly you'll just see publication supply because we're, we're beyond iterating tranches of data. We've gotten to the quality standard that we think we can integrate. And they will start, um, next week and they'll be placing um, four of those municipalities into live production in October if we if we hold to our current schedule. Then internally again with our own resources we're uh, building an automation engine it's, it's going to be titled the digital cadaster adjustment service and autom uh, sorry automation service and it'll allow people in the field to download the digital data do pre-field computations, go out and do whatever they do need to do in the field, 
undertake this subdivision and submit it automatically to attach to the cadastral fabric um, and be validated for accuracy and correct correct connection as it comes through. And we'll have that service live towards the end of this year. We're thinking thinking December of this year. So four stages, 15 million, 15 million, around 4 million, and probably another 4 million roughly um, on the automation component. Thanks. And where is this all sitting? Um, I'll pass to you after this one, Dave. But basically, if, if people had a chance to look at the, the Digital Twin Victoria launch video that came out recently, all of that in some senses is much less than what's on the screen at the moment and what's evident in the in the video from the launch. We are simply a more accurate positioning of the red line around the bottom of the property parcel and all those other assets rendered rich with their data in 3D is a whole other story, but it's very important that we have the base right at the beginning and that's what our project is all about. But in the end, it's um, the Internet of Things, it's the world of interoperable data systems, it's the world of deep dives into future states, as people in this audience would know, for asset management, um, proper planning of all things in all places across time, and that's a not too distant future. And I would just make mention that we also have uh, about to be released for um, finalisation, uh, the, the future strategy that Land Use Victoria um, is, is heading on along this pathway. And we're in a sense, in our work, building on the work of many others over a lot of years. We've been digital in many ways forever in Land Use Victoria and Land Registry, but what we're actually doing here is moving to a very different a much more integrated future that I think will, will deeply benefit the Victorian economy as we move into, into this new digital world that's rapidly unfolding. Thanks, Dave. Over to you for the detail. You're on mute, Dave. Sorry, Dave, you're on mute. How about now? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you. Great. Uh, so this is the digital workflow. Um, all those stages are working towards. Um, so we call it the circle of life so that the surveyor uh, takes observations. Those observations are um, forwarded for uh, examination. Uh, once approved, they, they are then are accepted and become an automatic update to the digital cadaster. On the right hand side, you'll see our, um, our DCM stages, so the back capture and the adjustment stages. They'll drop away um, as we, at the end of integration, but automation will persist. And then it's uh, automatically updated into the cadaster. And then we upgrade the um, relevant VicMap themes. So uh, everything from address to features of interest to um, VicMap uh, property with parcel uh, property, road casement, easements, etc. Um, and even Crayland Tenure in terms of its um, reserves and uh, I won't forget transport. There may be some uh, constrained um, linear features such as roads, railways and even uh, hydro water channels that may be affected by a movement in the cadaster. So um, that, that's what we hope to achieve um, and, and we're well on the way to doing that. Next slide, please. So this is uh, stage one. So this is capturing all um, plans that have a live title, all registered plans. So um, to do that, as Mark indicated, we're going back to the field notes where available and typing in um, all of those observations and connections to control. So that's something we haven't had um, captured before in a digital um, environment. We're using the uh, ePlan um, structure. So those, um, so land XML is the format, and we've got um, a manual there to um, describe how we do that. So um, uh, yes, so we're really unearthing, um, you know, up to 150 years of survey um, history for the state of Victoria. Next slide. So um, at the moment we've uh, parcelized or digitized over three million parcels. 
in this way. Um, we're finding that uh, each LGA has a unique um, cadastral profile, if you like. Um, and in some ways it's very unique. Uh, we are dealing with over 300 technical queries from, from our um, stage one contractor to our um, cadastral team. And um, we're really uh, yeah, preparing for this change of uh, making things more efficient and exposing this information for the first time. This is the stage one progress to date. Um, we started off in the west of the state, but very much concentrating on Metro Melbourne, and that's uh, virtually complete now, and looking towards um, completion of the whole state uh, by June next year. Uh, each of those um, land XMLs that uh, are being captured are available as individual files. Um, so this is just a, a close up of uh, the metro area. Um, and um, as Mark said, there are areas that uh, require additional control being photo nodes. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, which will be passed on to the um, geodetic team in the Office of Surveyor General uh, as additional control. Once again, something uh, we never had before. Next slide. Mm. This is the adjustment process, so uh, progress to date. The adjustment process is taking each of those individual land XML files, running a least squares adjustment um, as, as each new file is, is introduced for that given area, and creating a new parcel fabric um, based on the observations, based on the connections to control, and uh, based on the mathematics of, um, of uh, aligning those, that information. Um, Metro Melbourne, as I said, will be completed uh, probably in the next month or so. Um, we've already been uh, got Glenelg. Glenelg is um, the first truly rural LGA. Um, and we are um, gradually uh, progressing um, into um, across the state for uh, com a completion of stage two by June next year as well. This is a, um, just a graphic showing uh, Hobson's Bay. This will be the first LGA we integrate into VicMap. Um, so there's, you see a figure there of 37,000 land parcels. As Mark said, not every land parcel has a survey plan for its definition. If you think Crown land, maybe the, the um, original parish plan or township plan was the best we can utilize. Uh, that data is being used. Um, but it may get a lesser grading than, say, a new survey um, that's been done more recently. Um, there are discarded plans, so some plans do get discarded because they just haven't been able to close, or then um, they may, have, may be a partial, um, uh, the life title may only exist for a partial part of it, in which case it's been superseded by other information. So it's a it's a bit of a um, treasure trove and a treasure hunt to find the best data. Um, but our um, stage two um, inter, um, adjustment contractor is, uh, is um, doing well to provide us with this information. Uh, next slide, please. So this is probably the big question everyone wants to know. How much is the parcel layer shifting? If we just jump to the next table. Uh, this is... Um, this is the shift vectors that have been generated from current VicMap to a new adjusted um, parcel. We've highlighted Hobson's Bay here. Um, you can see the different um, um, measurements on the left hand side. Uh, in this um, group of LGAs, you'll see that 78% of the shifts are less than 0.5 metres, and there are some that exceed 5 metres. So these are metro councils, um, and in the main, those shifts are relatively small. Um, the degree of um, certainty is um, interesting, so we'll move to the next slide. So this is Hobson's Bay. Um, you're looking at, uh, this is um, post-integration. Uh, we have um, 160,000 points. So VicMap Change 272 was published last year to introduce CAD point into the VicMap property data model. Uh, points are being utilised via adjustment, and that's um, uh, the prompted us to introduce those into VicMap property so that there's a, um, a logical um, representation there. Uh, you can see here that um, 160,000 points 
um, as the intersections of each uh, parcel boundary and are now available to users. And importantly, there's a metric now or an attribute that's been uh, calculated from um, the least squares adjustment that gives you an accuracy statement on each point. Once again, that's something we've never been able to provide before. In the past, it may have been a compilation scale or a default attribute. And now for every point and then for every line and for every polygon, there'll be attribute statements, um, accuracy statements that uh, the user can use to um, judge um, the um, accuracy of each line. So here you'll see um, in the point cook area to the left, uh, quite accurate, a new area of subdivision, so um, new surveys, etc. Uh, along the coastline, along uh, creeks and, and natural boundaries, that accuracy less so because they're not defined by distance and bearing, and they've been defined by a drawing on the actual plan. Uh, so once again, that, that's a, a first and uh, something the user can utilise uh, post-integration. This is just a definition of that HPU. So it's a confidence level. So 95% confidence that that point is within uh, that actual uh, meter measurement. And that's just the change notice explaining that. So that'll be populated within each LGA as they're integrated into VicMap property. There are some um, tools that we have for stakeholders, um, realizing that this is uh, we've always called it once in a generational uplift in uh, data accuracy for the state of Victoria. Uh, the first one is the integration viewer. So at the moment we have uh, around 25, 26 LGAs that have that parcel fabric, but also the shift vectors from um, current VicMap to the adjusted um, parcel fabric. Um, the data is available for viewing and you'll see there there's even a, uh, a measure of the shift vector um, noted there uh, and, but more importantly you can actually download the data as it currently is and use it within your own GIS environment to work out the uh, impacts on your own data assets. As we roll through the different LGAs this will continually be um, populated. Uh, there are um, we're looking at three iterations of uh, data. So the first is um, the first delivery from uh, spatial vision. The second is the remediated delivery. And the third is the uh, integrated version we want to um, put into VicMap. So it's worth noting there that we are um, upgrading VicMap. So VicMap um, continues being edited. So something like uh, 30 uh, registered plans were received this morning. Um, so that also introduces a point in time difference between the uh, adjustment and the um, current VicMap and that's uh, something we've, we've got to cater for. So um, uh, yeah, the time differences is uh, something we've just got to uh, work through. Next slide. So the um, if we go back to stage one, what's actually being back captured? This is the um, in the pink. You'll see a you know a PDF that's uh, the artifact even today moving forward. So that's what's being delivered to uh, our maintainer to import the, that two lot subdivision into VicMap. If you go to the uh, larger panel, you'll see that uh, the what's being captured in terms of the land XML is all of the observations and connections to control that were utilized to define those two parcels. So in comparison to the PDF, you'll see that the actual area of extent is uh, far wider. You'll see connections to um, control, even to the far right, uh, far east. Uh, some control points in the, in the red were not utilized. So this is the sort of information that surveyors um, want to see. They can do a lot of um, um, desktop checking before they actually go to the field to know that uh, if they look in an area, they're likely to see that um, survey mark and, and establish that connection. And the existing um, observations are all revealed for the first time so that uh, they may not have to um, reinvent the wheel, if you like, and can utilise um, previous work in a way that's never been exposed before. This um, data, as I said, is available as individual files. Uh, James Laversary, our systems lead, has created a plugin for the QGIS um, GIS platform. 
and that's certainly available. You can certainly download these um, these files and then load it into the QGIS environment and view them in this way. Next slide. Uh, so this is more about the um, integration viewer. So we, we might just uh, move on from that one. So um, integration, as Mark said, integration is will happen in October this year. Um, so the LGA is the work area. So we're looking to do one LGA a week. Uh, the first four have been delivered to um, Jacobs to start uh, their pre-processing. Uh, it is a um, three to four week processing cycle of uh, loading and uh, providing us with a version. We do a QA check and then um, they've released the data into to VicMap. And then even after publishing in VicMap, there's post publication checks that will be underway as well. Um, what we've um, been doing, um, we've done over 200 um, consultations with industry, um, LGAs, utilities, uh, even yesterday our own biodiversity group uh, to try and get people ready for this, um, this change or be, at least be aware of it and the potential impacts um, on your own um, data assets. So one tool we have in place is the readiness toolkit and this is really a data governance toolkit that uh, asks questions like what's your reliance on VicMap currently? Um, do you have data that's aligned or offset from current um, cadastral boundaries? Or if it's uh, captured via GPS, maybe it's independent of uh, the VicMap cadastral boundaries. Um, and there are other templates that allow you to um, uh, foster some support within your own organisation about uh, how you would um, uh, get ready for this uh, rollout of uh, the um, DCM data in VicMap. So it's just an example of the survey that you can undertake just to um, ask yourself those questions. And probably the next slide. And as I said, there's some templates there that um, help you understand uh, what's required um, and how you get ready for that um, change. And there's just some uh, quotes we've we've heard. Um, some people have, um, you know, uh, we've visited some telcos in the last fortnight and they've actually congratulated us for this, uh, this um, upgrade in, in VicMap. Uh, and others are uh, still digesting uh, what the change means for them. And others like Charles have been um, a bit more proactive in um, trying to understand the changes as they um, affect their um, own data assets. Thank you, David, and thank you, Mark. It's, uh, it's an amazing project. I think uh, we've been, uh, I think, talking to some of our telco customers about the fact that this change is coming, and I would agree that they uh, there are various levels of readiness for this, but, uh, but I think it's an important step forward. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, uh, Charles Piscato is the Digital Intel Intelligence Officer at Yarrow, Officer, sorry, at Yarrow, Yarrow Valley Water. Um, he's uh, I guess probably known to many of you uh, in the, in this webinar, so I won't uh, spend too much time introducing him specifically. But welcome, Charles, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Hopefully, and everyone can hear there me. We there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, look. Uh, what uh, my presentation is just putting on the perspective of a uh, water authority where uh, um, I work for Yarra Valley Water, which is uh, uh, one of uh, three Melbourne water retailers service, servicing uh, over 2 million people. And I just wanted to give um, uh, an overview of how uh, we're supporting this rollout of this great initiative, DCM, is certainly going to be a generational uplift of the, our cadaster information. Um, but how's that play out within our world? So next slide, uh, whoever, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'll just give an, a bit overview of the history of our, informa our asset information. So it's critical to understand that history of where it's and how it's been captured. Um, 
where we're at in um, supporting this DCM project uh, and uh, and and the um, the analysis we need to undertake to support it. Next slide, please. So uh, for those who aren't aware that uh, in the mid um, 80s, early 90s, uh, what was undertaken back then uh, when it was back in the Board of Works days uh, was uh, we captured uh, by digitising hard copy plans all of our asset infrastructure. Um, from Metropolitan Melbourne, um, the sewer assets were captured at 1 to 500 and uh, the water at 1 to 1,000. Now that actually means that the uh, level of accuracy in those metropolitan regions is quite good. Um, however, rural Melbourne um, was captured at 1 to 25,000. Now back in the 80s, um, be hard to understand now, but Mitcham, which is where our head office is, was part of Manningham Council, um, was uh, uh, the hard copy plan was at a scale of one to 25,000, meaning for one millimetre out and when digitising means 2.5 metres out on the ground. And if you speak to some of the old timers who are actually uh, doing that digitising and back in the 80s, uh, there was a bit more uh, um, leisure at lunch times and uh, you'd go to the uh, hotel and have a couple and then uh, you start to question the leg of accuracy in uh, particular on a Friday afternoon of, uh, of some of our asset information. But it's important to note that post 1990s, what we've um, started, well, what we were started to do, it was receive information um, from surveyors digitally. And so it means that's spatial accurate. And, and that's really critical when we analyze the impact of the DCM within our environment, we actually need to understand um, how the data was captured. Next slide, thanks. So important too, when we look at um, our asset information is how it's being utilized. And this is critical that what we have uh, implemented 10 years ago was an automated spatial analysis system called Easy Access. What it does is support our development industry where they um, submit applications online. Um, previously used to take uh, um, three to six weeks in um, those development applications being uh, responded to. Um, now we can do it within five minutes via spatial automation with an underlying uh, business rule, rule engine. It's actually analyzing our spatial data, seeing whether all the applicable property assets exist, what type of asset information do exist, and then it returns um, all the, uh, 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 let's say, uh, classifications, restrictions on development associated to that property. And this is where um, it's so critical that that asset to property relationship is maintained within our environment. Um, because ultimately we could be sending out the wrong advice to those developers and essentially who's liable for that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I just, we've just heard um, the fantastic work that Delpa been doing. I'm just really now in this integration phase and actually understanding how we as Yarra Valley Water can support that rollout. Next slide. So here's an example where um, we're actually improving the accuracy of our data through this DCM project. Uh, what you'll see there is that uh, if you understand this plan, um, that the uh, water pipe asset is was constructed in 1954. You can see at the top there's a dog leg of that asset where it doesn't follow the uh, the footpath down. Where in reality I'm 90% confident that in in actual fact that uh, water pipe asset is actually following the footpath. Um, but due to the way the this asset information was captured and digitised, that it does have that dog leg. You can see the cadaster, which is the light green boundary, is also. Um, misrepresentation uh, in terms of the ortho rectified uh, photography underneath. And um, so this is where the DCM project in that light blue has actually improved that cadaster greatly. And as a result, we'll be improving the location or accuracy of our asset information. Next slide. Um, again, uh, just a different example is our existing cadaster on the left hand image um, showing um, from a cartographic perspective, everything's nice and neat, um, falling in line, the, the scale, the representation of the relative asset to property relationships relative to the offset measurements. Um, so it's all nice and neat. 
Um, however, when you put the aerial photography and you put the DCM data, you can see how it's improved the accuracy of that, um, that uh, cadaster land base. So if you see the dark green line falling directly above the house, um, that's purely uh, a, an issue with the existing quality of the um, existing cadaster and where the DCM um, now is actually fully aligned to the property boundary. But in relation to that, you can also see some um, challenges that we have and will face, whereby you'll get the text textual clashes appearing, the cartographic elements, that um, that offset to scale uh, relatively is um, uh, uh, essentially uh, degraded and also you can see the manhole that red dot there is actually falling on the adjacent property now so it just sort of highlights some some of the challenges we have when we implement the DCM data next slide and then what are the business risks associated with that for so for the before you dig industry on this forum um, you can certainly see that there will be safety and litigation risks so if you have a uh, um, do a dive before you dig request and you receive the information back to say that that property has no assets and they you start digging and hit those assets um, from um, and that's like I'm doing it from a water perspective but uh, although other utilities as well perspective there's certainly those safety and litigation risks and um, that needs to be um, understood and uh, each authority needs to actually understand and go through this exercise of how they can support this DCM rollout. Um, I'll, I'll just call out section 32 plans as well um, from a litigation point of view that uh, in any sale of property, we provide an asset plan. Um, people will actually review that asset plan and make a call whether or not they want to purchase that property on the grounds that they may be thinking, okay, we want to pull a pool in the backyard. Um, and the asset plan showing that there is no assets, so they may make the call that, okay, we can purchase that property. Um, and then subsequently they find out that hey, there is an asset in our backyard. Who's going to be liable for that type of misinformation being communicated? Next slide, please. Uh, so as we've heard, uh, um, even just this year, we'll have five councils being released and we're, uh, well, I've actually started the uh, analysis of um, Nilimbi Council and I'll show you slides on that. But as what was also previously mentioned by David was uh, about 20% of the council data is shifting by um, 50 centimetres and we'll need to actually understand that and how that impacts our world. Next slide. So in terms of how we're going to support this in the short term, uh, one uh, thing is that every week we actually get updated um, with uh, the moving cadaster, all the new sub developments through what's termed the IOF um, supp uh, VicMap supply of uh, property adjustments. What that then allows us to do is actually, um, oh, well, what's in communication with um, Delp is, what they've promised in, in the delivery of that DCM um, going live, uh, that IUF file will be quite large, but we will not, it will not contain any property um, inserts or updates on property. All it will contain in that one week's file is all the adjustments. Um, so that means then we could actually uh, miss that file and, and not apply DCM. But then subsequent IUF files, which is back to the normal updates, we'll, we can uh, actually um, consume them and use them to maintain our cadaster land base. But what you will then find is that you'll see, like that image on the right there, um, slight slithers occurring in some instances. But if we consider the um, split between infill and greenfields, greenfields being paddocks being developed, they should be all okay. The whole subdivision should fall in alignment, um, but the infill areas is where you're going to see these letters. So it, it, um, and you all can con consider the number of property corrections. The risk is quite low, so it allows us time um, to actually make the in the background the asset adjustments. Next slide. In terms of what asset adjustments we need to make, uh, I Sorry, if you go to the next slide and we'll come back to this slide. Yeah, thank you. So in terms of the asset adjustments we'll need to um, make is we need to do um, some impact analysis. 
And a couple of ways I've gone about that is with the release two of the data, the, the, the essentially the accurate DCM data that um, Delp have released, I'm looking at the SPI, which is a, 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 a unique identifier against the property within the DCM data, comparing it to our underlying cadastre base. And looking at our linear assets from the start, mid and end points, where those identifiers change, I know that that asset has now now falling in a um, adjoining property. And they're the issues I need to look at at, at a critical level because that's where we need to actually ascertain whether we're going to be adjusting our asset information. Um, subsequently, we can use the shift back. Sorry, go back a bit. <laughs> um, subsequently, we can use shift vectors to see where um, there's uh, greater than 50 centimetres of uh, 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 property boundaries being adjusted and that's where that spatial relationship while it's not as critical we need to from a cartographic element um, have a look at those issues um, but in terms of how we're going to achieve this one of the things that was questioned and, and uh, reviewed was whether we automate this and the issue then comes down to actually having the metadata associated to asset data to make that call um, and what ultimately we need to do is actually have a look and a good understanding of the history of that data so whether or not it's come from post um, that digitization post 1980s um, where the accuracy can be plus or minus uh, as we've heard um, two to five meters or whether it's uh, survey accurate information or it's come from field notes where it's essentially just people going measurements from the existing um, fence lines. Um, all that needs to play out when we to make the call on how we adjust our asset information as well as the cartographic elements. If we go back to the previous slide, uh, uh, just the process I've come up with is that when the uh, DCM data is uh, released, we'll re be reviewing, doing that analysis I've just seen, um, identify where we may have some data quality concerns and feed that as I already have back to some um, in some areas uh, back to DELP. Um, but then when the asset does need to uh, be adjusted, we need to actually make the call. How are we going to adjust that? What environment we're going to be adjusting that? And then ultimately, when the time is right, implement DCM. A uh, couple of slides. So here's an example of Nillingbic of uh, the analysis. This is the sewer analysis, looking at that spy information. Um, there was uh, 234 issues identified, then actually manually going in and having a look. The good news was there was only 38 issues um, as a result of that, uh, of what the analysis returned. So of those 38, actually only 12 was DCM issues. That's where, um, I've sort of got concerned of the uh, adjustment data, how it's been applied, so I've fed that back to DELP. Um, and then there's 26 locations where we we'll need to adjust our asset information. Next slide. Just quickly from a water perspective, uh, most of our asset uh, infrastructure uh, sits in road reserves. There has been adjustments in relation to how road reserves are captured within the DCM project. Um, and that means that there was a far greater um, uh, numbers being reported as issues. But on the good news is that, um, and you can see the site, the difference between the VicMath spy and the DCM spy there highlighted in that red box. But the good news is that um, when you've gone through and done that analysis and the and Further good news, when the actual release of this DCM data is done, there's going to be an attribute to say it's a road reserve, and I could actually probably ignore them when they're road reserve. Um, is just, uh, it, it, there was only three issues identified, and uh, two of which, again, were um, data quality concerns of the DCM data, and one was where we do need to shift our asset. Finally, a couple of uh, examples um, in the next couple of slides. Ooh. No, next. Oh, no, no, there was a couple of uh, images there, but that's all right um, that I, I did have. But ultimately, uh, it was shown examples where um, the DCM data um, has making vast improvements, and you see that in that uh, that initial uh, aerial imagery I sent. Um, and there was a subsequent one of um, where there's area of concern. But uh, ultimately, I want to um, throw to the floor to if, if any questions uh, have been raised in both from a Dell perspective and from a Yarra Valley Water perspective. And thank you, Pelican Corp, for uh, reaching out. Thanks, Charles. Our pleasure, obviously. 
Um, there are a couple of questions coming through at the moment, but I just I just wanted to sort of pose some questions or um, some suggestions to people. Obviously, some of the audience that we've got um, would be local governments and utilities and other um, uh, related sort of entities uh, within Victoria and, and from other states even. Um, but, you know, some of the points that, and takeaways that I guess we've got from the presentations that we've had are really for each organisation to then uh, really assess whether the assets are impacted by the DCM project. You know, Charles, you know, you've given us a great example of how you guys have systematically gone through uh, your records to determine what the impact may or may not be. Um, and if there is an impact, you know, obviously try to realign those records um, to relative accuracy to DCM. I mean, it, there's obviously different ways of collecting and documenting the data um, uh, or re network records in relation to, to other things. Um, also, very importantly, talk to your GIS team about what options are available. Um, and, and if you're looking to use uh, precision data capture, then uh, that's certainly something that, uh, that we can assist with some of our platforms, particularly GeoLancers 360. But um, Charles, just a question I've got to you, and, and maybe this can be a sort of opened up to the floor more broadly, but as a consequence of some of the improvements made to the cadastre, in relation to new assets that Yarra Valley Water is building, are you going to are you going to change any of the methods you use to collect and document those new assets? Um, so in terms of new assets, what I will call out is that uh, that they are um, development led primarily um, so um, we do get the, the server that like developers get surveys and provide that in a digital format but I think more importantly is let's say um, the DCM data uh, has been delivered we have looked and seen that um, that data uh, our own asset data um, accuracy comes into question so if we look at the ortho rectified uh, imagery and the DCM data is actually probably uh, closely aligned to the um, that image um, but our asset information is sort of in question comes into question then that's where that uh, something like uh, what you're showing there will need to actually um, ascertain the business risk around how we adjust that data or whether we adjust that data and then it may come down to like let's say um, the size of the pipe, whether it's a private main or, or our mains or, or, or things like that, to, to ultimately make the call whether or not we do feel there is a need to go out in the field and validate our asset data's location. And I'm sure there will be times where that will play out. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Charles. Nick, may um, I ask a question? Absolutely. Awesome. So my question goes, I think, pretty much to all of our panellists from this morning, which is what's the one piece of advice you'd give to our audience today to be ready for this change, um, knowing what you know now about the impacts or potential impacts of this DCM project? Charles looks from ready. My, yeah, for, for, <laughs> from my perspective, I, I think it's really around, um, uh, we all in our own industries have projects and, uh, um, and 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 issues being undertaken um, un unbeknownst is these like curveballs that get presented to us every now and but then you really need to like shift our uh, priorities um, to ensure that you're focusing and and prepared for um, this data that's coming because uh, uh, they, they can depending on um, as we've I've alluded to they're certainly um, uh, concerns around the litigation risk associated to um, this information being released and false information being presented um, that we really need to uh, I'd encourage you as soon as possible to sort of um, focus on how your industries are going to support um, the release of this data noting as I said that uh, um, it will be a generational uplift of accuracy of um, property information and your asset information so um, the more people can focus on it uh, in the short term um, the better prepared you will be in supporting it. Thank you. Mark or David? Any? I think Mark's on mute again. Sorry if I could just jump in there. Look, I, I, I think um, I would say take a leaf out of Charles's book. Um, he's been and his organisation have been deeply engaged with us all the way along this journey. 
<clears throat> and it's led led to the um, degree of preparedness that Charles has just described in in um, Yarra Valley Waters case. And also, you know, I think the big takeaway for me there is, like VicMap has always been, um, and like the services provided in our data has always been, we're into continuous improvement and we love to get the feedback. And, and it, it just helps everybody. I mean, I even now I've made some notes, Charles, just from some of the things you said there right at the end. Um, it's, it's just very useful. So, you know, our door is open. We will make the time to come to you, um, download the data and see what it means for your organisations, both in terms of, of, you know, risk and benefit, which is the world we live in every day, I think. David, is there anything you thought would like to add? I might just add, yes, um, being aware and prepared is probably everything. Um, we know the impacts on our own data to some extent, or we hope to most extents. We don't know how it's going to impact your own um, data assets, so that's why we've made data available. Um, you do need to register um, via SUSE or, or our, our website to get access, so please do that now. and. Uh, you can download that data and, and undertake that um, investigation. Could you remind us of that, that website address, please, for those of us that weren't quick enough to write it down earlier? Uh, maybe Susie could shout. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we could cut, we can cut it in. Yeah. Yeah, Susie now. Yeah. Yeah. We'll sort that out. Maybe. We'll make sure that's available. And I'm happy if these my slides are shared um, externally uh, at you. the conclusion. Great, thank you. Um, just seeing if there's any more questions. There is, is one from Chrissy, Chrissy Hind. Okay, uh, so this is this one's for Charles. When will you be rolling out and only using the adjusted data, data as we know from some LGs? They will need a year uh, before rolling out the adjusted data. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I, I don't actually have the answer right now. Um, so what we what was pleasing when the analysis on Nilimbic was that um, the the number of issues and adjustments is quite low. Um, it still um, is a challenge in supporting that. So we're uh, that's one of sixteen councils. So um, we're hoping that average. Well, the business case on supporting this project. Um, uh, and the funding for it, uh, it will be based upon that Nillenbeck analysis with some contingency in it, but uh, ultimately we'll need to have bums on seats to actually uh, adjust our asset information. Um, and then which point in time we actually uh, go live with the full DCM. I am hopeful um, that uh, in the next uh, seed file release, uh, Probably, I'm not too sure when the seed file will be released, but the seed file, for those who don't understand, is the next um, as a yearly supply that uh, um, gets alignment between your authorities' cadaster information and DELP's cadaster information. Um, I would hope that we are in a position to actually uh, implement that um, sometime next year. Fantastic. Thanks, Charles. It uh, looks like um, David's been busy sharing links in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, so if anyone can see, every, if everybody can see those, please um, just make a note of those uh, those links to to those pieces of information. Um, all right. Let's see if we've got. I think there's another question uh, from Chrissy. <laughs> okay. When is the expected date for VicMat plan to be in the new DCM position? Uh, is it per LG or is it whole state in one go? Uh, perhaps I can answer that one. Um, VicMap planning um, are uh, scheduling so they process the HLGA the week after we publish it. So it'll be done on an LGA by LGA basis and uh, so there'll be one week in arrears of our um, publishing schedule. And I could just add, that um, the planning group sit on the governance structure for the project. They're a steering committee member, been a regular attendee and have kept their eye on the ball very strongly at the management level, but also at the team and operational level where that shift work will occur in the week after publication. Right. 
sounds like a lot of good coordination and collaboration between the various parties, uh, Mark and David. Um, it, how long ago was this started? How, how did the how did the integration, the the coordination between all of the relevant stakeholders, kind of evolve from your perspective? I could um, start the answer to that one off. I mean, the the history of this one really goes right back to two thousand and eleven. Um, when there was a business case prepared, um, I think by SKM, or as they then were, <laughs> that had the project costed at $145 million. Um, and it's really only the, uh, the appearance of Dynajust as an adjustment engine that was um, going to change the manner in which the least squares adjustment could be undertaken, <clears throat> and the evolution of modern um, uh, aerial imagery of, of sort of combined to assist us to be able to do it. Uh, starting in 2017 and finishing in June 23 uh, was a four year project initially, but of course, like everything, uh, we have been impacted by some degree by the three years of COVID, although we've handled that fairly well and lucky that this type of project has a, a global supply chain but a workforce that can essentially conduct much of its work anywhere. Um, in terms of engagement, we've had to do a lot internally. Uh, Spear, Lassie, Vots appear to me as a, a newbie to this world. They're very dark caves down which trolls live. Um, there, are, <laughs> there, are, there are just so many things that we still keep discovering. Just in the simple, you might say the, the simple act of extracting your data and getting it to India for digitization sh should be straightforward. Just this week in some of the rural municipalities, we found new and previously unseen things. So we've had to collaborate and work very carefully with our own systems branch, um, with our own systems development capability, with the surveying general team and with the spaying team and with the land registry team. So it's been a big coordinative effort in that way. And then, as I think Susie or Dave mentioned before, and I'll, I'll throw to both Susie and Dave to answer the externally facing piece of it, but we have done over 200 engagements. Now, people mm. don't always hear a message until the message is close. Um, we understand that. Um, so we have we've we've sort of just kept chipping away and we're pushing it up a notch at the moment. But over to you, Susie and Dave, to answer that part. Um, probably the group you didn't mention Mark was the VicMap team themselves and they've been engaged um, in the DCM project and uh, are strong contributors to that of course um, and we have a you know ongoing relationship with uh, local government in the main through data exchange and the like but also um, more utilities etc so we're building on that existing relationship so yeah as soon as you move a parcel boundary there's um, a few people are interested. Mm. I think there's one last question here from from the um, from the field. Sorry, Susie, I, was, I jumped in there. You you've got one answer to come. No, no. Um, okay, I was just going to um, remind our team with a bit of a chuckle that um, we do actually have an engagement, ten o five. So um, at least David and I might have <laughs> to run off. Uh, we're doing a demonstration of the integration viewer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem, not a problem. Well, look, one last question was, uh, will this data automatically be delivered the, in the IUF data? Uh, yes, it will, but as um, Charles indicated, we've we've scheduled it so that the data comes in um, one week. That is, um, so maintenance is suspended for that LGA for that one week, and then it resumes as normal after that. So, um, and that was in reaction to the water utilities wanting that delineation between the uplift and the maintenance. Fantastic. Fantastic. I can hang here Thank for you, a minute or two, you too. So if, if you yep. need to go. Yeah. Thanks all. Thanks for the invite. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, David and Susie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, look, I guess um, we should probably wrap up. We could probably keep mm -hmm. talking about this for quite a long time, but uh, I think uh, it's probably uh, a good opportunity just for us to sort of wrap up. but. Um, you know, just to sort of conclude um, with a sort of shameless plug, but, um, you know, Pelican Corp as a business has been working in the damage prevention space for um, 
nearly 20 years now. Um, and uh, with our span of, in, I guess, the reason, one of the reasons why we're quite interested in this topic is simply because um, a lot of the information that we use in terms of the utility data, um, whether it be in the Before You Dig Australia process, whether it be in the um, collection and, and improvement of that data by uh, data collection in the field, and or whether it's another component, whether we're sharing that information through other means, you know, we, we kind of suffer the consequences of uh, the inaccuracies, or the, 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 the uh, or we gain the the, uh, the benefit of the accuracies of that data. So we are very much interested in the improvement and and, and I guess the reliability of that information uh, ongoing. So these sorts of projects are uh, are kind of uh, part of that, even though not directly related to the things that we are doing, but certainly uh, have an impact on us downstream for sure. So with that. I'll say thank you very much to all of our presenters. We really do appreciate it. I think the content's been mm. fantastic and the discussion's been really uh, helpful and hopefully helpful to the audience. Um, hopefully we can, uh, we'll, we'll make some announcements shortly as to the, the what's coming next in our series of uh, damage prevention uh, presentations. Uh, but thank you for attending the, the first one and uh, special thanks to our friends at Delp and, and Charles at, uh, at Yarra Valley Water. Thank you very much. See you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thanks, guys.